वाले साहब रहमतुल्ला इस्लाम में क्वेश्चन इज दैट वी समाइम रीड इन द न्यूज पेपर्स दैट पीपल डू लेट देर आईज आफ्टर द डेथ ऑफ कोर्स सो दैट इट मे बेनिफिट अदर्स स्टैंड इन नीड ऑफ कॉम और एनीथिंग लाइक दैट सो द क्वेश्चन इज इज इट परमिसिबल इन इस्लाम टू डू लेट वन ऑर्गन्स This question has been answered by me repeatedly in different personal associations. The fundamental principle in determining the right or wrong according to religion is this: what has ever has been clearly stated in the Quran to be wrong, that is wrong. Whatever is clearly stated to be in the to state in the Quran to be right, that is right. That is called mohkamat, the area where there should be no doubt, no uncertainty. Then the Holy Quran says that there are areas of mutashabihat, where no specific clear-cut instruction is found, but uh, the area is vaguely defined or appears like a no man's land between two countries. So there, the instruction is to keep on the safe side. Don't risk going too close to the clear-cut lines which have been defined of, of prohibitions. There is many prohibitions. So keep. It's better always to walk on the safe side of the uh, of the lines so that you may not misstep into the areas of prohibition. How can you determine which uh, policy is fa- safe, and uh, how to decide about which is right and which is probably right to say or probably wrong? On that, the principal teaching of Islam always throws light enough for us to decide. There are some fundamental principles which have been very clearly laid down. and in the light of those principles these individual decisions should be taken for instance it's very important for a muslim to learn that islam is for the benefit of mankind islam is for the service of mankind and service of god covers the area of service of mankind in a manner that one remains not separated from the other ultimately they merge into one single teaching of service so service to god service to mankind belief in the unity of god belief in the unity of humanity they are the two principal teachings of islam which should be borne in mind so where you are in doubt whether something is permitted or not if that something falls in the category of service to god and service to mankind then you should, you should not entertain any doubt about its being permissible this particular issue in my view is very clear because nowhere do we find any prohibition of donation of organs in the quran or in the sunna and we know certainly that it is for the benefit of people benefit of those who need these things if a dead man's eye can be of service for a live man's eye and the blind can give light to the to to those who can see what better thing could you conceive than that by your service now i speak of the uh, reservations expressed by some mullahs against this and also some are so 
element in uh, denouncing this practice and calling it clearly a violation of Islam, they think that after death we will be raised from the dead in our physical form here. So they, th they think it will be very difficult for God to collect the eyes of different people scattered all over the world if the eye is gouged from a dead man's eye socket and is transferred to another man's eye socket they think it will be very difficult for God to do all this and why to create difficulties for Allah <laughs> that seems to be underlying you know objection against this number one this uh, concept of resurrection is totally false it has no foundation in the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran clearly lays out that we will raise you into something of which you have no knowledge. So don't we have any knowledge about ourselves, our form, our body, etc. So that means that uh, the resurrection will be in a spiritual form which is so far beyond our, the reach of our imagination that instead of attempting to make us understand what, would we, what we would be, the Holy Quran says, you have no knowledge of what you will raise you into. So, the physical eyes and physical cells of human body have nothing to do with the resurrection. Number two, if God so desires to resurrect a body, that issue has also been mentioned in the Holy Quran. It says if the, the particles of a body are scattered all over the universe, wherever they are, God is capable of uh, taking them out atom for atom. You know, this is not exactly as it, as it is mentioned, but this is the spirit. And uh, bring them into one a whole again. That also is mentioned in one hadith. Now uh, that uh, mention which I am going to, let, to, to speak on must be taken metaphorically because the Holy Quran has already clearly laid down that it will not be bodily, bodily resurrection but it will be spiritual. But to make us understand that we cannot es escape resurrection. The Holy Quran, the, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu speaks of someone who was uh, extremely sinful in this world. So sinful indeed that you can't imagine someone having sinned against God beyond that person. Now before death he willed that uh, his body should be burnt out and turned to ashes. Then the ashes should be spread partly in the four winds, partly in the rivers, partly scattered all over the soil. And uh, that was his will which was at, uh, after his death fulfilled according to the letter. And when he was presented before God, or will be presented before God, God would inquire from him, why did you do this? Tell me. <laughs> So he's, he would say that I was a sinful man to a degree that beyond that one could not imagine what sin could be. So to escape your punishment, to escape your wrath, I had this device, you know, it came to my mind, this is the only way of escaping. So according to this tradition, Allah would say, if you did it for fear of me, then I forgive you. But he would be resurrected and God would tell the wind and the earth everything to bring everything together again. Now that everything, putting everything together again is in fact a spiritual something. What we do leaves some uh, imprints on our soul, on our body, etc. Part of those imprints are let's say those imprints appear to be attached to this uh, physical body somehow, but they are the spiritual part of that. 
So what will be recollected would be that spiritual part, not the physical part. It is like our souls. They live in a permanent relationship and apparently inseparable relationship with our bodies here. But they will be separated from the body and the earth will return to earth. Like in Christianity they say earth to earth, dust to dust. So that is not which will be resurrected. What will be resurrected would be the influence of human soul, human thinking, human practices on one's uh, living cells. Th those impressions will be extracted somehow from those cells and that will, they, will, they will be gathered to create a new person. So as far as the donation of I is concerned in the light of what I have said, the things should be very clear to us. Number one, the eyes will not be collected as such, as the eyes we have, but uh, the power of vision we have, their distortion or their clearness, that is what will be collected. And uh, as far as the particles of body are concerned, I have already demonstrated to you, wherever they go, it's not difficult for all. The mullah should not be over kind to God if they want to do that. Again, you remember that physically, now not physically, but uh, our common sense tells us that uh, such a scenario is totally absurd and impossible. That when we die, the same body we leave will be resurrected. If the same body is to be resurrected, then the poor ugly people, the dwarf people, the disabled people, what would happen to them? <laughs> and someone dies in young age, someone in very old age of tottering, so will they be raised with the same appearances and same weaknesses and same bodily pains, etc.? So that is to be ruled out absolutely without any hesitation. The concept of physical resurrection, I mean, has to be ruled out. It has nothing to do with the realities of the Holy Quran. Next, please. Yes. Would you please bend a little bit or raise the microphone to your, your, your level? Now, by the way, you introduce yourself, please, before you ask the question. Uh, um, my name is Mansour and um, I'm a Neil Amadi. Um, um, Mansour and uh, I'm, a, I'm a Neil Amadi, I just... No, no, Mansour is the name, I, I heard that. Yeah. From which country originally? Of Nigeria. Nigeria, right. Yeah. When did you become an Amadi here, mashallah? Um, during this time, Abad. Okay, right. Um, my main question is actually divided into three categories. And um, every time that I think about this question, I try to, sometimes I feel scared. And uh, the first one is particular about the um, destiny, destiny of human beings. And um, the second one is about free will. And the third one is about law of universe, which is particular law of cause and effect. Um, the first question is, did we um, choose our destiny by ourselves, or is it being chosen by, for us by God Almighty? And um, is it being hidden away from us? I advise you to refer to my verse during last year Ramadan, on a verse which dealt with this question of destiny. And uh, I answered various questions as well which uh, came from all over the world through telephone. And I hope I covered many aspects which generally agitate people's mind. So you better listen to those cassettes or see the video and I hope inshallah you will be satisfied as to the from the answer as to the nature of destiny as we understand. Okay. Um, the second thing is, um, what's your opinion about the law of 
of cause and effect. Concerning what? Law of cause and effect. Cause and effect is also covered by the same question. Cause and effect and destiny yes, are inseparable questions. Cause and effect uh, principle plays a very important role in the, under the question of destiny. They can't be separated from each other. Okay. That also I have attempted to cover. Ah. And um, the third one is, um, I was actually studying the early Quran and um, I found something that uh, um, I wasn't be able to interpret properly. And uh, it's in chapter 2 of the early Quran, um, I think verse 7 or something like that. It says, those who, had, who have disbelieved, it's been equal to them, whether thou want them or want them not, they will not believe. Allah has set a seal on their heart and their hairs, right. and, and over their eyes is a covering, and for them is a great punishment. Now, this sentence about um, Allah has set a seal on their heart and their body. That seal is uh, mentioned after the fact that they will not believe. Where the will is attributed to those who reject. So there are people who decide that whatever may happen, we are not going to believe. These are the people whose hearts are sealed and they can receive no good from outside. So any goodness cannot enter their hearts. This is the meaning of the seal. Because if you are determined to shut your eyes, how can the sunlight force itself into your eyes and into your heart or into your I mean, mental processes which uh, uh, determine the presence of light. So this is exactly like that. If you do not make an effort to receive the truth, it will be like your eyes being blind, your ears being stamped and so also your hearts. Next. And uh, the other one is uh, it's, uh, prophecy. Um, when the prophet of Islam um, prophesies about the promised Messiah and the Mandi, um, it, it mentioned that the Islam, a time will come when Islam will be declining. That is, most people will be practicing um, the wrong teaching. And, um, well, basically, they, they are com they, most of them will be committing sins, right? But um, is it actually right for us to say that these people actually committed actually commit um, actually committed a great sin because for for the prophecy to come true, the the uh, the decline of Islam is supposed to um, begin. I understand your question clearly. I think he's talking about the, promise, uh, the prophecy regarding the promise of Islam coming when the decline of Islam will begin, uh, uh, will have taken place. And he's now, I think, asking, if, uh, that's what I meant, that is this the decline of Islam? And this is why the promise of Islam is coming. This is what I get. Which, which is the, the, the decline of Islam? Huh? The, generally, the Islam, uh, the world of Islam. Islam right. <coughs> but before that, let me add to the first, uh, uh, to, to my answer in respect of your first question, the second question I think. The problem with, with, uh, with, with some people is that when they read they think this is because of what follows that God has put a seal on their ears, on their eyes, uh, on, on, the, on their eyes are covers, and God has sealed their heart. This is changing the order of things in the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran doesn't mention it as a result of that, but mentions the, the following verse, is as a result, of what is mentioned in the following verse is, is as a result of this cause and that is effect. So your question of cause and effect comes into play here as well. What is the cause and what is the effect? 
The Holy Quran says the cause is that they will not believe. So this will happen. Some people change the order and say that is the cause and this is the effect. They will not believe because God has put a seal on their hearts and so on. You understand now? But if you read the Quran carefully then you very clearly understand that first is the cause and second is the result of that cause. That is the mean, that is to say if the effect of that cause. Um, now your second question. Yes, do you want to say something else? Yes, um, because I find it very difficult to actually distinguish between sin that is someone actually committing a sin and um, the will of God that is, is being there's no you see, that we will understand by listening to that cassette which I just mentioned. But there are some principal verses of the Holy Quran, like I mentioned in answer to the first question, which belong to the area of Mokkama, things which are very clear without any ambiguity. No verse of the Holy Quran should be understood in contradiction to what has been clearly laid down. There are the principal verses under the light of which everything else should be understood. Here the, the verse which I have in mind, which controls these things, which commands the entire area of human uh, uh, choice of sin or, or goodness, is from Mansha Kalyomin, from Mansha Kalyakko. God has laid open the right and wrong and clearly differentiated between the two. Now it is for everyone. Either to choose the path of righteousness or to choose the path of sin. Whether to accept or to reject. So when this decision is left to the choice of man, then you cannot say that there is an, a destiny overimposed over this decision. If you understand death to happen, then the choice is given and withdrawn. There is no choice left. Follow that? Mm -hmm. So every verse of the Quran on the question of sin or righteousness should be understood in the light of this uh, unchanging principle, domineering principle. Every man has the freedom to choose the right or the wrong. Okay? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Now this is the last question. <laughs> the last question was, that what we see today in the world of Islam is that the deterioration which uh, is mentioned in the, in the tradition that during the period of general deterioration in the Muslim conduct of mm -hmm. beliefs, etc., mm -hmm. Imam Mahdi would come or Messiah would appear. Mm -hmm. Yes, obviously yeah. this yeah. is it. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thanks. Assalamu <laughs> And is there anything you feel that Ahmadis could do, like writing either to our own governments or directly to the new government in Pakistan? And do you feel that if things will improve there and Ahmadi are recognised, that we can have then the right to perform Hajj? Yes, inshallah. As far as this election is concerned, if you were... Uh, uh, in presence in Jalsa Salana last year here in UK, the last Jalsa Salana, there's annual conference in UK, and if you remember what I said in this connection during my last address, I recall that portion. I advised the politicians of Pakistan not to remain under the misguided view that Mullahs do have an importance in the affairs of the country. I say it is you who, by your misunderstanding, have given them a lift beyond the level to which they could rise by themselves. 
So they have been artificially boosted by your wing them. Stop doing it. Let them run the election for by themselves. And then you will see where they stand. They cannot defeat you. The temperament of the country is not in favor of the Mullah. That is what I said. And although up to now in all elections, Mullah somehow had been had contrived to mix with some political parties and uh, cover up their weaknesses because they emerged with the parties in diff on different sides, political parties, established political parties, and shared the, their, the honor of their success. This time with the grace of our lives to happen, that no Mullah had any political alliance with the established two, two political parties. And they have been so totally defeated and destroyed their claims of capturing the new government and forming the new government and bringing about a revolution in the name of Islam has proved to be absolutely false. And uh, the Pakistani people are now clearly writing on this. So that shows that uh, this was an exaggeration on the part of some people who thought Mullah had a role to play. The people of Pakistan have rejected Mullahism in this election. So that is one step in the right direction, but only a beginning, a humble beginning. Still, they have a role to play to a degree because both the political parties, the major political parties, are uh, very close to each other. One has an edge over the other, in the center, one has an edge over the other in some province, etc. But the number is so close that uh, a stable political government cannot be envisaged. So what I fear is that if they do not unite together, both will run for the Mullah's support, although the number doesn't exceed 10 in the National Assembly. But they would try to gain some number and for some support from them. And whenever they do it, the politicians do it, they always do it on the cost at the cost of enemies. <coughs> they bargain on enemies, not against their own rights. So they put to stake the Amelia issue and uh, Amelia's safety and Amelia human rights in the country, etc., etc., etc. And in sacrificing that, they can go to any limit because none of them is scrupulous enough to decide these issues on fundamental principles of absolute justice. So the, there seems to be a change in the air, but to what degree it will change the plight of languages in the country, is yet too early to say. Secondly, unless the ordinance that uh, um, <coughs> the ordinance by, by the ordinance, I mean the one which was promulgated by late dictator Zayalak, which has been incorporated in the Eighth Amendment of Pakistan, as long as that uh, ordinance is not abolished. There cannot be any uh, possibility of rehabilitation of Ahmadi's right as equal citizens of Pakistan. So that still uh, hangs like a sort of democracy over the heads of all Ahmadis. So if the two major parties unite and if some foreign powers give them a word of advice, now is the time to do away with this, all this nonsense then of course we can breathe a sigh of, sigh of relief after that.
in me one of these, that is those who got uh, initiated into Anjali this year, then I'll uh, submit others as well to come and ask any question if you so wish. And that I will begin with this, of course, this child, Dr. Bhujeev's son. What is your name, please? Bashir. Bashir, Bashir Haq or Bashir Deen? Bashir Haq. Bashir Haq, thank you. Yes, please. I've read in lots of books that none of the prophets of Allah committed sin, but I've also read that Hazrat Adam committed sin as well. But he... You see, this question of sin should be understood in the terms of relativity. Some things are uh, sin in the sight of man by ordinary standards. Some things are sins in the sight of Allah by the standard which Allah expects from people, uh, from among his chosen servants. So, those things which are called sin with respect to the this elite uh, class, the chosen servants of Allah, in ordinary life cannot be termed as sins. The small mishaps here and there, shortcomings we, we refer to, uh, by sh the word shortcoming we refer to those which are called sins when you apply them to the higher action of society. So the word sin should be understood in this wider perspective. So when we say the prophets of Allah are sinless, by that we mean that that area of sin which is clearly laid down in the Quran as sin. By all standards they should be considered sin. They never commit such sins. Their sins belong to an area of uh, uh, shaded area of ambiguity. They, they could have decided, like Mutashabi had mentioned earlier, they could have decided on this course or that course, but uh, by mistake they decided on the wrong course, not with the will to commit sin, but this was a human shortcoming. So that is why they are also expected to do istighfar, that is, seek from the of Allah. In case of Adam, the Holy Quran is very clear on this. It says, Adam committed sin, but Wallam Najid Lahu Azma, we never found in him a will to commit sin. So that is always once and for all. To commit a sin willfully is in fact the real sin. But to commit a sin without a will, without determination to do, by mistake sometimes, sometimes it happens, that is a different category of sin. You understand? So these mistakes may occur here and there, but they are pardonable because they don't belong to the serious category of sin. Still the person will remain sinless. Again, sinlessness can be created with forgiveness. If you are constantly seeking forgiveness of Allah, whatever mistake you have committed is totally washed out. And you become as if you are a newborn baby. So that also applies to the maximum to the prophets, all prophets of Allah. Right? Okay. But you are an intelligent boy, mashallah, you thought of this, you know, very clever. Yes, please come. Assalamu alaikum. One sound introduction, please. My name is Zahid Nepal. I'm originally from Mauritius. What? Originally from Mauritius. Mauritius, yes. And I've been living in England for nearly four years now. Right. And uh, I'm living in London, basically. Have you got initiated into Ahmadiyya this year? <laughs> I was born in Ahmadi. Right. <laughs> Good. <laughs> So, Where have you been hiding yourself ever since? 
I'm Vizur Aminos. I have to introduce myself. I'm a nurse and I've been trained at Lewisham and Guys Hospital. Wow. Um, my question is in connection with um, a great dilemma the West, the West is facing. Um, I got a friend. He, he, he was not Muslim. Then he became Muslim. And then I was trying to do tablik with him. And then he, one day he confessed to me and he told me he is about his sex, sexuality, he's, he's gay, he's homosexual. <coughs> and he asked me for help. So I'm, I didn't know how to help him. And i really like to, to throw some light on it. And how can we help them, the gays, like the homosexual? How can you help them? Yeah, how Don't can we? Them. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, what I'm saying is, how is <laughs> You can admonish them, you can advise them, you can tell them, you can remind them of the Nawa and what was what, the second Sodom. Sodom. And tell them after this, what doubts can you entertain? What right can you do to entertain any doubts? That's all that you can do about it. Thank you. Yes. 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 I read uh, in one of the Prophet Muhammad book yes. and uh, it was regarding miracle of the Holy Prophet Muhammad that the trees travelled to him. Huh? Trees travel to him. Ah, yes, yes. Could you kindly throw light on it? And the tree did not travel towards him. Where is its mention that the trees travel towards him? Well, this is how I understood. It is, I think, in Kitab al No, no. It is said about and the stump of an old tree on which the Sulaim Sarasam used to rest his hand while delivering sermon. The Sahaba removed the pulpit from there to some distance from the tree. And the Sulaim Sarasam, while addressing, stopped and told to move the, uh, st the stage of pulpit back to the original position and put his hand over the tree. And he said that while addressing, I could be moving from the tree. But he was missing that hand. And that was the vision of Allah. That was the vision of Allah which also speaks of deeper, profound realities which, of which the Holy Quran also speaks in another verse which says that all things have, which have been created, praise Allah. But you have no way to find out how they do it. You don't understand. So that means the level of consciousness sinks deeper and deeper as you begin to travel backwards from human life. And those animals whom we think cannot pray, they have no consciousness in, of that nature, they also possess something of that nature. And that is something which we should understand even through the exercise of common sense. If God has provided every living being with the knowledge that the human being requires for their own survival, if they have always been well programmed, even the fly knows how to live and how to survive, even the ant, even the amoeba knows what to do. Even the bacteria have got the invade method to attack certain cells and become parasites on these things. They target their, the, 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 the cells absolutely rightly. They know which cells to go to. If all of these things have been inbred into them, 
why not the realization of a creator? That has to be there. It's all important for the creature to know that I have a creator. So that is how this question will be resolved. According to the Quran, it is not just life. It is every form of, of creation which knows how to praise Allah. And that level of consciousness may sink to much lower order. Whereby, according to human terms, we cannot describe it as a conscious praise of Allah. But there is no doubt in my mind that somehow, at their own level, they have that realization of God's creation. And that is to which the Holy Quran refers. And in this regard, this is a unique verse which is found in no other religious book. You can search right and left, you will never find anything like of it. This is one of the extraordinary beauties of the Quran, outstanding sign of this truth, that it goes to such depth of uh, uh, knowledge and relates things to us which a man of resource and age could not even dream about. But this is uh, what happened. So this, the tree issue, the consciousness of that tree, is not just in my mind a region. There has to be something, some way of, of tree's ex consciousness, which was conveyed to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that is why he moved back to the same old place. Yes, please. Um, I'm Sayyid Ahil Ahmed and I've moved from Jeddah to Islamabad Jamaat. Um, so I have a question here. Um, in our daily prayers we pray Rabbana Atina Fi Dunya. Yes, and um, someone told me that Hasana can be interpreted as a wife also. Hasana, hasana mm -hmm. can be interpreted as a wife also. As a wife? Yes. Um, Hasana, if her name is Hasana, then of course. <laughs> <laughs> or Hasina, something like that. Um, if Hasana this is, is so, everything good. Pardon? Hasana is everything good. Okay, then. So in that way it covers wife and husband, everything. Okay, then. Um, th this is a question that uh, in, our next in, in our next life, uh, according to next this. Next life? In our next life. Next life. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, you are still on the subject of life. Yeah, well, yeah, I am in a way. Um, according to this prayer, if it is, if it, if, if we cannot interpret it as a wife also, then will will the wife in the next life be the one of this life? And uh, you see, if she is Hasana, yes, not otherwise. <laughs> Unless you are Sayyidah, yeah. then of course you will be denied anyway. Well, I hope not. The, the definition of hasana applies to the wife. She is being in the sight of Allah. And if the person who is the spouse of that wife also is hasan and goes to heaven, mm -hmm. then most certainly they will be right there. Okay. Um, so second question is, uh, what role... You are not yet married. Pardon? You are not yet married. Are you? No, I am not. Um, so, what a flight of your imagination. <laughs> Um, second question is, what role will they play in the next life, if they are together? They will not bear children, that much I know. <laughs> okay. What else, we don't know, because the Holy Quran says, no eye has seen what will happen there, no ear has heard. But there will not be that physical contact which you can see when you think of husband and wife. Okay. Okay, so you seem to, to have lost interest in that. <laughs> <laughs> you know the way you like to do it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, please. Next. Yes, please. Um, so this question has been 
passed on to me right. as your congress mm -hmm. uh, but she is not present uh, in the hall at the moment right. um, she said that she was studying the attributes of Allah and she finds it confusing that uh, why has God um, given himself the names all knowing and all aware as two separate names don't um, uh, they appear together if uh, God is all-knowing, then all-aware should be included in No, what are the original words used? Without that I cannot di differentiate between one and the other. I should learn which attributes she is referring to. Not the English translation, but the original ones. Between Al-Aleem and Al-Khabir. Al-Aleem and Al-Khabir. These are the two. Okay, yes. Now, complete your question, please. So what is the difference between the two? <coughs> you see, Ali means one who has the direct knowledge of something. And Khabir is someone who is informed about something plus who takes care particularly of things, how, what, how they are happening. So, in, quest, in, 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 in uh, with regards to one's actions, etc., sometimes it is used Allah is Ali, which means whatever you do directly, it is known to Allah. And sometimes it is said He is Khabi, which means He is wary of what you are doing and He is taking care as well of you. In the word Ali, taking care concept is missing. That is a completely neutral word where somebody has a knowledge but not, does not necessarily take care of the person who stands in need or punishes a person who does a misdeed. So the word Khabir is beyond that. He is not only aware but he would respond to that and would take care of those who stand in need if they are good people and will punish with those who punish those who disregard his instructions. So this there is a difference of order and difference of reaction of the person who knows things, which are mentioned in these two different attributes. Yes please. Assalamualaikum. My name is Sadat Ahmed Mubashar from Essex Jamaat. Um, we claim we are the best. Um, why is it then that um, in the last eight or nine hundred years we still lag behind the Jews and the Christians in terms of technology and um, worldly What advanced? happened during the last eight hundred years? Tell me. Why don't you take note of that? Um, I mean, you in terms of technology and worldly inventions. What has happened during the last eight hundred years? I tell you one thing, it is it will make it easy for you to compare, make a good, correct comparison. As long as the Christians were practicing Christians till the time of Renaissance, they were lagging behind in all knowledge because Christianity was working as shackles which uh, arrested their progress because the concept of the universe as presented by the distorted form of the Bible which they had inherited was at odds with the realities of nature. So they had to abandon one to, act, to, uh, to accept the other. And that was the religious rebellion which started practically, well, not with Galileo alone, but even before that it had started. But Galileo became the symbol of that rebellion against the inherited knowledge of the universe through the Bible. So when they said goodbye to that, then they started progressing unlimitedly. It was exactly the opposite with the world of Islam. As long as they understood the Quran and practiced the Quran, they also were the, the thought bearers of uh, uh, sciences and philosophies and knowledge of all sorts. When they abandoned the Quran, there came then a phase in their life which 
like this is like the setting of a dark night. And until now they have not emerged from that. Look at what happened in Spain. That was like a medley race in which the torch was handed over to another people. It started from there. When they started fighting with each other, when they started disregarding the teachings of the Quran, when they started living a life of luxury under the titles of caliphs, etc., and the courts of Spain were turned into any worldly court in their style of life and in their indulgence in all everything bad, that was the time when the destiny made them hand over the torch to a people who were not better than them in practice, but who were emerging from a sort of darkness to a new light. And from then on, they lost the light of spirit as well as lost li li life of physical uh, phenomena, I mean, the light of uh, spiritual knowledge as well as the light, light of corporal knowledge. Right? You see, if it was a fault of Islam, then they should have been the worst of people on the face of earth when they were close to Islam. So when you make this comparison, then you begin to see the things in the right perspective. Hazur, my question is about miracle and it is in the context of the scientific principle that matter cannot be created. Now if we look at the life of the Holy Prophet, there are many incidents when food or milk or water will increase so much that a whole party was filled up to their desire. How can we possibly explain that? You see there are many possibilities, not one only. One can be the possibility of uh, a vision. A vision which was so powerful that it uh, also had deep influence on human psyche. I remember reading in a book of parapsychology an experiment carried out by Dr. Rizale or something like that from Czechoslovakia who uh, experimented on human impression and belief and how far it can uh, satiate the real desires and requirements of food. So he, according to this, that report, experimented on some people by putting them into deep hypnosis. They were made to believe that the cow which had, which was full of milk in her teeth, te 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 what do we call teeth or whatever it is, <coughs> they, they are sucking their milk and they are being fed. Now, after a few days of deep hypnosis, when they, they were weighed, they had not lost any, any weight. And they woke up very fresh, as if they were properly fed. Now, the rest of the report I can't believe, but it goes on saying that uh, the cow's milk decreased. So, I think that part should be exaggerated and uh, could very well be exaggerated. But the first part can be believed in because for that we have the support of Hazrat Musim Islam's evidence on this and the evidence of many of his companions. Sometimes one is hungry, one sleeps on an empty stomach and God feeds him in the dream with something which uh, produces such, uh, uh, you know, such an influence on human desires and cravings, etc., that when they wake up, they're absolutely satiated. If they drink something, they do have no desire to drink water. If they eat something, they feel uh, the energy and the experience of a man who has been properly fed. So these things can be relegated to that area of human psyche which uh, is under control of Allah, is fed of course, 
but some of which, of, of which we have no knowledge as yet, but of which we have gained experience not only in religion but even in uh, outside the religion world and experiences. Secondly, Masih Mada has uh, mentioned, which also I have spoken about many a time, that uh, the laws of nature have many tears. Some laws are known to the age, a, a, to a certain age, certain time, some period in human history. And the others are unknown. So sometimes when they discover those laws later on, then they will know that somehow the laws they had known to be uh, totally dominant could be, sub to, could be sub subjected to change by more and superior powerful laws. Of that I have given an example in one of my, my uh, addresses as well that the power of magnetism was unknown to man of previous ages. But power of gravitation was a common day experience although he didn't understand how it worked but he knew the forces of gravitation were over dominant over everything else. If somebody had discovered magnetic force and had put some magnet over the head of somebody who was like uh, some warriors were clad in iron and that magnet would attack that person, people would call it a great miracle, you know, something which is overwhelming, baffling for others. That would be a miracle, but a miracle of knowledge and a miracle of uh, implying that knowledge to the surprise of the rest of the world. So because God knows all the laws He Himself has created, some superior and dominant laws are brought into exercise by God. And that is why people of that age don't understand. So the difference between the, a scientific, uh, uh, I mean, a, a science, scientist producing such a thing and God producing such a thing at the hand of a prophet is very obvious. The prophet of that age, where when this miracle happens, belongs to an age where that knowledge is lacking from man altogether. Neither the age of the man at that period has any access to such knowledge, nor the prophet concerned himself has any idea as to how these things operate. Secondly, the medium of operation that requires another step in that direction. If you know the theory, it is not enough. How to manipulate things with the help of that theory needs another step forward, the, the know-how, how to bring about things uh, by subjugating these laws. That is the second step which is, we know, was absolutely beyond the powers of the prophets of the earlier ages. So that uh, miracle which appeared to be against the laws of nature, I believe, according to this uh, uh, instruction of the Muslim of Islam, was not beyond the laws of nature as far as God is concerned. As far as the, those who observed such miracles, that could have been. Now, I would notice, put his hand into his, uh, pressed it against his bosom, took it out and it was shining. Now, any Tom, Dick and Harry can make, repeat such a miracle by using some phosphorescent elements in the pocket and uh, taking it out and then rubbing it and wiping it out later on and so that the shine disappears. I mean, such things can be manipulated and have been manipulated. But Moses had no knowledge. The people of that age had no knowledge. As far as, far as the miracle of uh, the star eating up, the snakes created by the stakes or ropes is concerned, 
That is also very understandable as far as I am concerned because the Holy Quran itself throws the light on this subject. It says they did not actually produce or transform the ropes into snakes. What they did was they cast a spell on the eyes of the lookers, onlookers. And as such the ropes appeared in the imagination of the people around to have turned into snakes. So what the staff did was it broke that spell. And uh, that is all. They suddenly saw that the snakes disappearing. So that is the meaning of eating up those ropes, those snakes. Yes, please. Yes, please. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Yes, I heard you. Could you please come close to the microphone? I find it very refreshing and also very inspiring to see that those who have made a conscious decision to embrace Islam and Islam with you. However, at the same time, I am also aware of much apathy and lack of interest in many of our young ladies who have no power or intention of seeking knowledge or witness to Allah as our young ladies do. How do we propose that we should deal with this situation and how are our young ladies to develop the same enthusiasm that our new ladies are showing? Yes, it's a very good question. I, I think uh, there are so many possible answers which I could give you. Number one, always begin with prayers. Because the Holy Quran has very clearly laid down that hearts are in the power of Allah and no man can change the hearts. Here the heart refers to the will of the people. If they want to have, a, have something, they will have interest in that. If they don't want to have something, they will shut their eyes to it. This is in fact the, the same question which has been asked before and uh, the answer is also the same. So if the people have no desire in something good, you should always begin with praying to Allah to make them interested. And it depends on your earnestness of prayer and how seriously you uh, take the prayers to be able to, to bring about changes in the real life. Then the prayers will be responded to. It has a direct relationship to your attitude to prayer and your earnestness. So I am quite certain and this is my experience throughout my life that uh, things begin to happen after an earnest prayer in this direction. People who had no interest in goodness previously, they begin to show some interest and with the grace of Allah, one man's prayer for another man becomes a boon for him. <coughs> Secondly, put this question to your own psyche, to your own self. If you are not interested in something, why are you not interested in it? What can make you interested in that thing? Now, it's a law of nature that uh, operates in every man. Everyone begins to take interest in something which he finds of interest to himself or herself. Otherwise, there will be no interest in anything else. We become interested in food only when you, are, you feel hungry. Otherwise the same food just loses all meaning to us. So to create desire and hunger in someone requires many measures. If somebody is diseased, then you have to uh, diagnose the cause and find out what disease is responsible for that lack of interest which you see in every, every healthy person as a natural phenomenon. Why some people lose interest in food which is essential for their survival? So there the cause and effect would come into play after you have correctly diagnosed the person. That is why hikmah has been repeatedly mentioned in the Quran as the first step towards conversions towards inviting people to the path of Allah. <coughs> so you must understand this and then try to create some interest. 
Now, the symptom answer can be very complicated or varying in application to different people in different situations. But one answer I can give you of general application is this, that according to my experience, people become interested in people first and then in ideas. Not directly in ideas. Particularly if the ideas are such as require a change in their life and a change in their society, etc., then the principle of equilibrium would work against the new idea because they don't want to be disturbed. They are happy where they are. So you have to find out ways and means how to make them realize that they should not be happy. They are not happy. They need something. So that would be creating interest in the idea. But the other part which is easier and which generally works is the fact that you behave in a manner that people start taking interest in you. They are surprised and happily surprised by your conduct. The way you conduct yourself in a society, if you conduct yourself with goodness and with consciousness to spread goodness, you have to not only be good in yourself, but you should give a taste of your goodness to others by helping them, by, by being kind to them, by giving them always the right advice and so on. So once they begin to take interest in your person, they are bound to be led into the next step, which is the interest in their ideology which made you. So to be, I think, to begin with, you start experimenting on these three things. And number one, prayer. Number two, trying to discover the underlying melody, the dysclasia, which uh, uh, causes this lack of desire and hunger in, in, in them for things which are good. And thirdly, the easiest path after prayer is to conduct yourself in a manner as our, to be of interest to people around you. Next please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam to Allah. My name is Nadi Farah. Yes. I'm one of the new converts. Yes. I just wanted to ask that um, if, if someone close to me um, passed away for um, taking an umbrella, which I believe to be a sin, um, and I continuously pray for me, um, could that sin be forgiven by Allah? If you read the Quran, are you convert from among the Christians? Are you from uh, some African country, Nigeria, etc.? No, Jamaica. Jamaica, yes, right, yes. But uh, were you Christian before this? Yeah, I was. Yes. That is the reason why you, you ask this question. Yeah. Because the Muslims know right from their childhood that sins can be forgiven. And nobody has to sacrifice, no innocent person has to sacrifice himself for the sake of the sinful and take the burden of their sins. You can understand this uh, uh, issue, this, this question better by applying it to your own nature. At least you, you, you read in the New Testament that God has created man after his own fashion. Fashion man after his own shape or uh, after himself. So that is a wonderful clue to us for understanding the nature of God. So if man can forgive, why can't God? <laughs> Where did the man learn the tray and very deeply found the tray to forgive? And why he forgives, what he forgives, to what extent he forgives. If you apply this question to yourself, then the, you will have a much deeper and uh, truer concept of forgiveness of Allah. And you can uh, tap this knowledge uh, through you to your advantage. And uh, you know, those people who may be wrong, even in ordinary life, by mistake, you know, they, 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 they brush against you in a hurry and they say, I'm sorry. And if 
you look at the person and you know he is really sorry, you would certainly forgive them there and then. So, sins which are preliminary, in which there is no will, like I mentioned in the case of Adam's sin, they are immediately forgiven if the person is sorry. But even if the sin is very small and incidental and or accidental, uh, and the person you know probably walks as if he doesn't care for you, you will not forgive. Even if you say, I'm sorry, you know, in, in your own uh, formal mechanical voice, you will not forgive. You may not say it to him, but your heart will feel still the pain and anguish are having been offended against. So, extend this experience, human experience, to other fields where people are against you, disobey you, displease you. Why you forgive and what, re what are the requirements of forgiveness? If you fulfill those requirements of forgiveness in relation to God, then you are seeking forgiveness from, from Allah would prove effective because he is kinder to his people, his servants, than man is to man or man is to human being in general or woman if you, if you insist, I should also include the word woman. If a woman forgives the sin of others, why not God is kinder to people than a woman can be. Azur, um, recently I attended some meetings w uh, held by the international relief agencies right. like the um, Safer World and Amnesty International, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Refugees Council. Right. And there was a sense of hopelessness um, in regards to what was happening in the Balkan states. Mm -hmm. uh, with the disappearance of Soviet Union, there seemed to be a, a vacuum of power in those countries. Had you not this experience of yours, would your opinion be different? Uh, I was going to ask... Have you Azur. not dialogued with them and, and, and heard from them what they think? What would be your personal assessment of the situation? Well, That of hope or hopelessness? Hopelessness. Okay, it's a common thing. Yes. You don't have to refer to these organizations. Mm. What I, what this I was is, this is the common uh, impression of the whole mankind today. Yes. The hopelessness was also shared by the people who were there in terms of politicians. And they felt that they, in the current arena where United Nations have failed in Bosnia, where Europe has failed in Bosnia, they feared that the same things was inevitable in those states because of the ethnic uh, groupings within those countries. Does Hazur think there's any way we can avoid such a thing in those, in the given framework of the world at the moment? You see, the basic issue is simply that of uh, willful act of injustice or uh, injustice out of uh, a situation which, which is uh, imposed on you, you can't help. Th these two things apply differently to different nations. There are powerful nations in the West, in Europe itself, who singly could have tackled this issue and stopped the aggressor from aggression. If Europe's collective mind had permitted Germany to do that, Germany could effectively do that. There was no question of any, you know, prolonging of this, this misery. So they are in fact willful partners in the crime. There are other uh, Muslim states who also are to a degree criminal partners in the crime because they have never raised the voice powerfully enough to make the powerful Western nations realize that if they do not uh, do the right thing by the Bosnians, they will lose these friends and they will go away from them or they will keep it in their minds to take their revenge whenever it comes their way, when it becomes possible. Now, that realization should, is only born out of deep sincerity. Verbal protests do not mean anything. Even a child understands when a mother means something and when she does not mean anything. 
when a mother is addressing a child, don't do it, does it repeatedly? Well, the child knows it happens, you know. <laughs> but when she cries, she says, don't do it, you know, shouts, then things happen differently. <laughs> so that's what I mean. The Muslim countries have been saying, oh no, 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 no this is very, very bad, you're doing, not doing justice and this and that. They understand the Western language. But if they speak the language of the Prime Minister of Malaysia in stern terms, then the West has to take notice of that. Like the television, press, etc. took notice of one single voice of the Prime Minister of Malaysia, which is so far removed from, from here. But they did not take notice of the protest of the united will of the Muslim countries uh, expressed in their resolution. So they also become partners in crime. But then uh, there is the ordinary public. What they can do about it? They can also behave in a manner that they can participate and become participants in the crime or absolve themselves of this. If they do whatever is in their power to do, then they will be absorbed in the sight of Allah and in the sight of history uh, as uh, people who did what they could. Like we are doing, Amadis, all over the world. But if you sit quiet and say we can't do anything, then nothing can, nothing happens and then you also become a silent partner in crime or a helpless partner in crime, let's say. But nobody is helpless in fact. God has given everybody a power to, to raise his voice of dissent or voice of criticism against some crime. If he does it powerfully enough, within his capacity of course, then the collective voice of condemnation of a crime does produce effect. If he doesn't, he speaks of the hunger and the misery of the people and does not parti uh, participate in, in the act of removing that hunger physically, then also he is a silent partner in crime. So with the grace of Allah, I can say for Ahmadis, all over the world they are participating in this uh, at least uh, amelioration of the misery, if not the removal of misery altogether. Thank you. Well, Sam, after this, sir. Sir, so, there are two questions from the ladies. Yes. Uh, the first is from Sister Latifa of Jamaica, yes. where she probably couldn't explain herself uh, when she asked the question. Uh, okay. Her so, question was that if somebody close to you commits suicide and ends their own life, and if you were to pray hard enough for them, would God forgive them? You see, it's not, I understand now, the same answer applies to this situation as well. In fact, Allah knows best the circumstances under which somebody committed suicide. And it does not mean that all those who committed suicide would certainly be driven to hell straight away. Some people do it out of madness and we know in the Holy Quran, mentioned in the Holy Quran that somebody who is out of his senses and does something in unconsciousness is not held responsible for, for that act. So in sleep you can do things, nobody would consider you responsible for that. So that is madness also uh, is a factor which lifts from you the ordinance of Sharia as long as you are mad. Now, outsiders cannot judge the type of madness which may cause uh, suicide. And uh, as, as such, we can't take the decision into our hands and say, he was mad, so it's all right. Allah knows best. So that is why generally, the janaza prayer of such people is not said. It doesn't mean that uh, it is not said out of hopelessness for them. It is because we don't know the affair of such a person is the hand of Allah, let him decide. As far as the prayer is concerned, that always plays a role in such affairs. 
but again it depends on your earnestness and your standing with Allah also. If your standing with Allah is very close and uh, your earnestness is impelling, then your prayer may produce some favorable effect, even uh, in cases where, which are otherwise hopeless. So you must continue to pray for such people, but don't say Janaza prayer officially and there too there are exceptions which are made. And uh, according to the recent, uh, um, you know, recommendation received by me on this issue by uh, MD scholars whom I told to work on this, I can say that the previous notion that nobody can ever say the Janaza prayer of such people has proved to be wrong. It is proved that the Jamaat can take a decision according to the circumstances to say the Janaza prayer of such people, but it should not be done in a manner as to give the impression, to create the impression that their act is condoned. It should not be encouraged. It should not be promoted to crime. But in a you know subdued tone, in a manner which is uh, just a manner of fulfilling your responsibility and duty towards duty towards a dead person, in a low tone this can be done. But it should be done by the jamaat. And in one case here also, in the light of that recommendation, I informed Amir Sahib to go about it and think that another was said of such a person. Huh? It, it was in Harris field, you know, it took place and the janaza was said. So remember that uh, we must condemn this act very strongly. We must take all measures to uh, enlighten people on this issue. The basic issue is that of murder in fact. You can't take life. That is the issue. Life of others is a murder, so also your own life. You can't take life, why not? Because you are not the creator of life and you are not the possessor of life. Life belongs to God. So He has the right to give you permission under circumstances to take life. And beyond that it is murder. So murder is, is, is extremely bad whether somebody else is murdered or you, you murder yourself. So that is the heinousness of this crime. So like uh, sometimes you pray for the murder, murderers as well. So this is a self-murderer for whom you can pray of course. Right. Next please. Ah, the second question. So after this, it's Raja Sahib's turn, then will come your turn. Yes, please. This lady says that there are some non-believers, atheists, who claim they see true visions and dreams from God, calling them towards the Christian faith. She says she knows of one lady uh, who is very virtuous and who claims that she saw several visions of uh, Prophet Jesus, peace be on him, calling him to Christian, calling her to Christianity. Yes. And so she has converted to Christianity. Uh, how does one explain such visions and such claims? You see, these visions can uh, be the product of human psyche, human thoughts, human views, etc. And uh, such visions which relate to such vital issues as to one's fate and one's future after death <coughs> must not be made on such trivial evidence of such dream. Such dreams must have an internal evidence of truth in themselves. Otherwise, if you start taking decisions on this, some psychic person see that in, in dreams that you should murder somebody, you should do this act of violence to someone. So if such acts are permissible and uh, you promote such uh, actions following such dreams, 
then the whole order of things will go topsy-turvy. Particularly in relation to important issues of life and death, of redemption or condemn, condemnation to eternal wrath of Allah, such decisions must not be based on such flimsy evidence as having seen a dream. But if you are otherwise convinced of the truth of the religion and you want further mental and uh, a, a mental support from Allah, then these dreams can play a very important role, of course. For instance, some people get convinced through their study of the truth of Islam or Ahmadiyya, the true Islam, then they have done everything and yet they do not find courage in their hearts, that final strength to take the vital leap. Only in such cases Hazrat Muslim of the Islam is advised istikhara and Hazrat Muslim of the Islam assures us that after ordinary satisfaction, if you need special help from Allah, then you do istikhara, then Allah will give you help. Otherwise, this issue is not dependable because some people who are inimical to Ahmadiyyat, who are determined not to accept Ahmadiyyat, they sometimes tell you that they did istikhara and uh, God led him away from Ahmadiyyat, led them away from Ahmadiyyat. There will be the counter evidence of those who are more pious in, in, in general terms and uh, good people who see very clear-cut dreams where they are led to Ahmadiyya. So, and putting everything in balance, what would be the corollary, what would be the natural inference you draw from this? Naturally, one has to be very cautious on these things, otherwise just by the chance of a dream, you will be either led to heaven or to hell. So, such flimsy evidence of a chance dream should not be taken seriously in that regard. Further prayer is required, further investigation is required. Again, when Jesus Christ said, be a Christian, what did he mean? What is Christianity? Did he advise her to become a Paulian Christian? Or uh, an Aryan Christian? Or Christian of any, of, of, of a Catholic Christian or a Roman uh, or Protestant Christian and so on and so forth. When he said be Christian, it means be the Christian who Jesus was. And what Jesus was, that has yet to be determined. So if you study further and find out what Jesus was, then you are bound to reach the conclusion that he was a monotheist, he believed in one eternal God. He never asked people to worship Him. Not in a single instance did He ever tell anyone to bow, to, to prostrate before Him and to worship Him. So, if that is the type of Christianity she has accepted, then it is good, but it is only the first step towards the truth. Such true Christianity is bound to lead to Islam ultimately. This is the second question you have asked. Now, Raja Zafar Sahib. Assalamu alaikum, Hazur. Wa alaikum, I have got two questions, but uh, I want to put in uh, this question in Urdu. What? Okay. In Urdu. Okay, okay. The first question is that we have read Namaz Allah Ta'ala ke Hazur. But if we are in Atta Yaap, we say Assalamu alaikum, Yohan Nabiyo. You see, this the change of a person from third to second and second to third does not always indicate that when you are addressing somebody in third person he is away and different, distant from you. Nor does it indicate that when you address someone in the second person he is present before you. This is only a style of speech or which I will explain further with reference to your own regular uh, practice in Urdu. Sometimes somebody is standing before you and, uh, and you say, uh, Aan janab mein ye kiya. 
you know what anjana means the third person who is not present <coughs> so out of respect for him while he is before you say that person has anjana means not you um, literally means that person who is not here and sometimes you refer to a third person and say aapne ye farmaya why uh, uh, just a minute when you said aapne ye farmaya you are not addressing that person whom you are addressing you are talking of someone else for instance when you speak of hazrat mohammed rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam you go on saying addressing someone that aapne ye farmaya aapne ye farmaya it doesn't mean it is the one who is standing before you whom you are addressing so when you change the tense not not the tense uh, what what you what you call this the, the person when you change the person from third to second or second to third why do you do it out of a sign of respect so in this regard i take this uh, prayer suddenly out of respect for rasul ekrim sallallahu alaihi wasallam you change his person from third to second and also to create a sense of personal relationship with him as if you were addressing him you know to bring his concept closer to you and that was that is in preparation for what is to follow what is to follow is the shahud what is to follow is durood which is all in third person so if the second person address was to be taken as the presence of rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam what followed should also have been done in the same style but suddenly the style changes so this only is to create a psychological sense of nearness to hazrat mamur rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam with that sense of nearness when you send durood on him send salam on him that will have a greater force rising from your heart right jazakumullah azur dusra sawal zara complicated hai shayad thoda sa lamba hai zuri ye hai ke suraj yunus suraj yusuf ayat 104 mein hai wa ma aksaru nas wa law harasta bi mu'minin aur uske ilawa ek aur jagah quran jid mein hai ke kyun hazrat yunus alaihi salam ki qoum ke ilawa koi aur qoum iman nahi lai iske ilawa bhi iman nahi lai nahi बेनिफिट नहीं किया उसने इस पिश, उस हलाकत की पिशगोई से इसके अलावा भी हजूर पास जगह पे कुरान जीत में ऐसे चीजें मिलती हैं कि जिससे पता लगता है कि इंसान की अक्सरियत जो है वो गुनागार है और अक्सरियत जो गुजर गए वो भी गुनागार थे आम हजूर सल्लम ने फरमाया कि हर बच्चा जो पैदा होता है वो दीन फितरत इस्लाम पर पैदा होता है तो जो पहला बच्चा दुनिया में पैदा हुआ वो भी फितरत इस्लाम पर था तो फिर गुना इंड्यूस कहाँ से हुआ फितरत पर पैदा होता है फितरत पर ठीक है फितरत पर पैदा होने का मतलब है एवरी बॉडी इज गिवन एन इक्वल फेयर स्टार्ट देर इज नो डिस्क्रिमिनेशन वेदर ए चाइल्ड इज बोर्न इन अफ्रीका और चाइना और जापान और इंग्लैंड ऑल चिल्ड्रन आर गिवन वन सिंगल फेयर स्टार्ट ऑफ टोटल न्यूट्रेलिटी एंड द एबिलिटी टू चूज फॉर दम distinguish between right and wrong this is fitrat so when they exercise their power of choosing between right and wrong wrongly then they responsible for themselves if they exercise that power rightly then also they will benefit from that decision so you must understand the fitra the fitra is still in you still alive you can refer these questions to yourself and find out is it not right the right from the early childhood you had this uh, choice of taking decisions at every step of decision making right or wrong there were small things of course in childhood which confronted you but you knew as a child this was right this was wrong even if somebody makes the first act of stealing commits the first act of stealing the child knows it is right it is not right so that uh, fitrat is referred to in general and which has been mentioned elsewhere in the holy quran 
that Khalaq al-Insana allamahu al-Bayan. God created man and taught him the art of distinguishing. The Bayan also applies to the uh, power to articulate and to express yourself. But basically the Bayan means to make distinction between one thing and the other. And that is what the speech does. Makes it clear to others what uh, but you think of this and of that. So that power of making distinction, distinctions between one thing and the other is called Bayan. So that is the part I am talking about. This is Fitra. The Holy Quran has explained itself what Fitra means. Khalaq al insana allamahu al bayan. So if that bayan is not uh, exercised to your own advantage, then this is what would happen which you see in observing the world. But it's not because God has imposed this on people. Man in general will follow this why in general. This is the question. When man was created for goodness, why it so happens that in generality, in larger majority, people will choose the path of sinfulness? Because it is a downhill task. The gravitational force pulls you. And to work against the gravitational force requires a special effort and a will. So to achieve higher stages, to, to, to move towards high stages uh, uh, of uh, spiritual attainments requires efforts. And because down his task is easy when you don't make any effort, you automatically go downward. So that is what works against man. And only those succeed in achieving a higher order who make a willful effort to do that. Otherwise, they will all fall prey to satanic insinuations. And that is what happens. Azur, agar down, uh, downhill task ko hum shaitaniyat kya lehen, to nauzu bila nauzu bila wo galab hui. Kya? Agar downhill task ko shaitaniyat kya lehen, shaitani ko toh mazhoor kya lehen. Mene nahi kaha shaitaniyat hai. Mene kaha hai ki ek overwhelming power hai jiske khilaaf work karne ke liye ek khair muri effort chahiye but you, you are oversimplifying my answer uh, while you had started by warning me that it is going to be a complicated question so why don't you try to understand a complicated answer <laughs> fit to in, uh, in response to a complicated question I only gave one simple example to make things easier for you. This is a law of nature which you immediately understand. But that does not mean that every response to the attraction of gravitation will lead you into destruction. It has very important role to play in your life to your advantages as well. So you can't dub it as a shaitaniyat as a whole. Yes, next please. Azur, this is the question that Allah Ta'ala in Quran Jid has said that we have the death of the death and the death of the death and the death of the death and the death of the death. Azur, the thing is that when any person has a death of the death or a death of the death or a death of the death or a death of the death جانتے بوئیتے ہوئے کوئی شخص کسی امتحان میں داخل ہوتا ہے کامیابی یا ناکامی لیکن جب موت یا حیات تھی ہی نہیں تو اس چیز کا تو تصور ہی نہیں کہ کون اچھا ہے یا کون برا ہے تو اللہ تعالیٰ نے خود پیدا فرمائے اور اگین that is a very naive understanding of this verse which has led you to this problem خلق الموت والحیاتہ means two poles one of death and one of life. There are so many stages in between and everything on, in, in, in existence is either traveling towards life or traveling towards death. For instance, every chemical reaction proves this fact that uh, 
there are two types of chemical reaction one of conservation of energy which is uphill task and the other of release of energy which is the downhill task so when you have the energy released by a chemical reaction then that is the traveling of that thing towards death comparatively it sinks to a lower order and become less powerful becomes less powerful when you make an effort to pack something with energy like battery cells are packed with energy that is an uphill task where you pack things with uh, things with energy with some effort so that is travel towards life so even in death you find the apparent death i mean these two poles where either you are traveling to an earlier form which is lower in order of development or a higher form which is higher in order of development so this is the meaning of the holy quran le nabluwa kumayyu kumasun amala the trials of life depend on which course you choose for yourself on one side there will be death but easy travel journey with spurts of energy released from that traveling in that direction but ultimately that would not be good for you what would be good for you ultimately would be travel in the upward direction with some effort of course jazakumullah jazakumullah assalam alaikum wa alaikum dr naim how are you yeah, alhamdulillah uh, as as i said my name is naim ahmed from middle jamal Uh, so my question is uh, regarding the role of contraception in Islam I'm sure you may have answered it at some of the place but just a, a brief uh, uh, if i understand correctly from holy quran uh, god uh, almighty says don't kill your children due to poverty and on the other hand the understanding of uh, most of the methods of contraception aim at prevention of a formation of individual that means it doesn't violate that principle so it doesn't mean concluding that they most of these methods which doesn't harm the individual they are fairly islamic number one and number two if uh, i as a part of uh, my profession if i have to be a i have to assist uh in killing of a, a abortion of a individual as it's a lawful land do i stand accounted accountable for it so you see if you now let you have mixed two aspects of the yes, question together yes. let's take them separately okay. so the first question is yes i understood yeah, okay as right. far as the holy quran is concerned it speaks of one particular aspect of this and warns us against it you will earn the wrath of allah by uh, practicing family planning for the fear of paucity of food that is what is mentioned if you do that then you in fact you are throwing a blame on allah of being incapable of planning things rightly in this world the laws of nature which produce food for you in your opinion have fallen behind and cannot keep with the pace with the laws of human reproduction so when one uh, law in effectivity is left behind the other law that is poor planning that is lack of planning so that is the reason why the holy quran very clearly lays it down that uh, you must never practice um, family planning for the fear of paucity of food i have spoken on this subject and proved that feminines feminines in the world in reality had no relation to uh, outgrowth of popula- population they occurred in the history of man when earth was very sparsely populated exactly at the same rate and with same consequences 
And at one time in the history of man, in any cross-section of man's history, you will find that uh, if there is famine in one place, there is abundance of food in others. And uh, it is the lack of sensibility of man of one region to the people of another region which generally cause this. And also famines are very important thing. They play a very important role in pushing the wheel of human progress further. In, in you know, in, in creating the requ desire to learn more about certain things. And as a whole, it is beneficial for mankind. So you can't just dub famines as a whole. And uh, the message is, even if you do planning, you will not be able to uh, resolve this problem, which is independent of this. Uh, they're just mentioning at the national level. So if we're talking about at a level of an individual... I'm, I'll come to that. Yeah. This also is covered. In fact, I have seen individuals with so many children at a lower poverty level ultimately emerging to be, to grow rich and wealthier and better than many others of their uh, fellow beings in the same situation with less number of children. I have seen such families continue to suffer with only one child. And all their lives they, they suffer in poverty. But those who had ten children or more, their class is completely cha changed and they, you know, they, they rise into a different class uh, of, of society as far as wealth is concerned. So these things are irrelevant in fact. Uh, if I understand from your answer, uh, if, we are, if somebody is planning family because of the lack of the food or economical reason you shouldn't practice it, that's the Islamic teaching. But if somebody is practicing, say in a world of today, people have their own no, preferences, I, 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 I'm going is to it come, permissible I'm then? going to cover that question. You know, I, you've already asked, I, I know. Now, that is as far as this reason is concerned, First of all, it is not a valid reason, as I have proved from the history of man and from the, our experience of in different families. Secondly, it is uh, not promotive for the ultimate interest of nations, particularly for the poor nations, because large-scale emigration from poorer regions to richer regions are always caused by this inner growing compulsion and as a, a, a recent report from the United Nations has uh, pinpointed this factor of poverty sending large numbers of people belonging to the third world into the first world and they carry the atmosphere of the third world into the first world and it is not just uh, serving the cause of the poor people they have left behind but also serves some much deeper causes of bringing together a universal understanding of man and this problem and also it is educative to the people of the first world. It's not just a benefit which flows from one side to the other. It's a both way interflow of things and ideas and benefits together. So, if you consider this question in larger perspective, you will believe that the Holy Quran is right. Secondly, coming to the question of other uh, factors which may uh, give you permission to practice either family planning or to the, the abortion. Now, as far as the stages which uh, cover the period of embryo where he has not yet reached the level of being capable of living as an individual after the birth, that is a stage which is very vague, where you cannot 
with certainty say that uh, abortion at that stage is killing of life. But when the doctors know that there is definitely a possibility, if not probability, of the child to have been delivered and to be able to live as an individual, then on the application of murder would begin. That is a far more serious case than the previous one. So there are three stages of family planning. Number one, when nothing has happened, when the two germs and the, the germ and the ovum have not yet met. So that is also prohibited if you do it for the sake of fear of poverty. But for other reasons, management reasons and things and that, you can take your own decisions, but uh, you shouldn't take license, free license to do whatever you please. Man is created to uh, reproduce and for the survival of the species it is good. And if you, particularly if you have a good message to deliver, a good conduct, to create an example for the rest of the mankind, then you must reproduce more. This is exactly what Ahadur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has spoken about or advised us very strongly. He said, I want my Ummah to outgrow in number all others because this is the best people which God has created. They, they, if they now outnumber others, they will be a benefit to others. So he advised, he advised us, marry such women as are more loving and produce more children. So this is the common advice which should be borne in mind. Now come, I come to some other uh, uh, you know, requirements which may permit you to exercise uh, either prevention or even abortion. There the principle, the simple, one fundamental principle is this, that that life which is already formed and established is superior in rights to that life which is in formative stage. So if there is a danger to the life of the mother of some sort and the doctors determine that this child could be of some uh, real danger to her health, then abortion even at the stage of the life of the child would become permissible, provided that it is also permiss permissive, permitted by the law of the land. So there the doctors should take uh, their cue from two different angles. One the angle of morality as far as they themselves are concerned. And there is a guideline as I have already mentioned in the, as laid down in the Holy Quran. And second, they should take their direction from the law of the land. They should not violate that law either. So if you remain within the four walls of this, you are alright, you are safe. Do you include the uh, uh, health of the newborn, uh, new life as well? Is it fully formed? It is, and no, no. You don't. Th that is that is a very very uh, controversial area because if that principle is accepted, then should you should also be permitted to kill the invalids and uh, the patients who are suffering out of mercy and so on. That's what's happening at the moment. Other, it? this is what is wrong. Thank you. Uh, my last question was, if I have to do the same process that, as a part of a duty... if you are within the four walls of what I have mentioned already, yeah. then you are safe. Right. Otherwise not. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> yes, please. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullah. My name is Sophie Chaney. I'm here today. Yes. Uh, I think we got a, uh, my sister must have been our initiation here in January this year. Yes. And um, I just want to ask a friend of mine um, when he has a visitation of her father, ghost, of her father visiting her. 
and also many other outfits seeing ghosts and spirits come to me. Um, I just want, is, does the Holy Quran information for these? Yes. <coughs> As for the word ghost is uh, a vague term which is understood differently by different people. Correctly speaking, strictly translating this word, it means the soul of a dead person revisiting earth and uh, making contact with the people living around. If that is the definition of a ghost, then according to the Holy Quran, all those who die, they would never return to this earth. They are never permitted to make a contact with the living. So that sort of ghost is, experience of a ghost is an unreal experience. Either this, or is it, it is a type of vision, or it is a type of psychic experience. Type of vision in the sense that sometimes God wants to give you a feeling of contact with your dear ones which you have lost. And sometimes you see them appear in real life as if they have come with the same body, dressed up like human beings. That is not a proof of the existence of ghosts, it is a proof of non-existence of ghosts. Because ghosts cannot wear that dress. The ghosts do not have the same shape. So, I am surprised at those simple-minded people who think that because such experiences are common in the world, so there is certain proof of the uh, existence of ghosts and they are making contact with the human beings, living human beings. When you see them as human beings walking like yourself and addressing you using the same word, you should immediately realize that after death, the soul does not have a form like yours and does not stand in need of dresses like yours. So it has to be a vision, either a vision or a hallucination. So vision can be distinguished from a hallucination by certain evidences, internal evidences and sometimes external evidences. The internal evidence is of uh, some messages which they give to you, things they which they speak to you, on which they speak to you, and the, sometimes those things are not known either to you or to others who died before this, these things. When these things come to pass, as they were mentioned, then you have to take this seriously and you should must believe that it was Allah who organized this vision for you to give you satisfaction that you had met really a, a, someone whom you had lost. Now, when you, I say met, I do not mean that met really in the sense that a person really appeared before you. It's only a message that is a bridge of communication has been created by Allah whereby you can assure yourself that something of the same nature is also experienced by the parted, departed soul. And that soul is also sharing this pleasure of coming into contact with you. So these experiences must have an internal sign of truth. Sometimes there is also an external sign of truth. And that is created by Allah somehow, we don't know, but it does happen. I can quote an example which happened in our family. When my mother died, after that some time, my father remarried. And uh, one of our, uh, we call them aunties, but she was more than an auntie. She was the auntie of my father the wife of her late Hazrat Mir Muhammad Ismail Sahib. On that day, this news of the remarriage of Hazrat Muslim Maud was published in Al-Fazl. She left that Al-Fazl just as it, was, it came, without opening it on the page where this was mentioned.
and she went to the bathroom to take bath. As she came out, while the, she was still drying the hair, she suddenly saw my mother walking into the room, <coughs> going to the table, opening the alfazal at some page and looking at it and then disappearing. Now, while it was happening to her, she had no fear. She has no, you know, impre no realization of what she was seeing. Thing, you know, she she knew she, my mother was dead, but it seemed to be so ordinary and, and matter of fact thing to have happened. And as she left, then she realized what had happened, and then immediately rushed to the table and saw the alfazal open at the place where the marriage of my father, the second marriage of my father was mentioned. So this is the external evidence that this, the news was related to my mother and she had a particular interest in that uh, news item. And uh, that also is a proof that uh, those who leave you are not totally disconnected and disconcerned with what is happening to you that has a message of happiness for us and contentment and also a message of responsibility. That means if we misbehave and bring uh, the name of our elders to shame, that would also hurt them as good things please them. So that is how I understand the question of ghost in the light of the Holy Quran's teachings and in the light of our experience which is not based on uh, hearsay and hocus pocus. This is a very solid experience and there are so many other examples to this than the one I have just mentioned. But in other terms ghost is understood to mean something like a jinn, some form of life which is not necessarily a departed soul, but something alive belonging to the realm of spirits, that also cannot be ruled out. There is a possibility of such a thing, but I do not like Jamaat Ahmadiyya to overemphasize this and become superstitious. Very occasionally, once in a blue moon and less than even in a blue moon, you come across such phenomenon, but that is not important, that is not material, it does not change our lives. It just happens perhaps to give us uh, a, a taste of the otherworldly things, to let us realize that we are not all that are, that belong to Allah's creation. So if we believe in angels and that is not abnormal and unnatural, so, if other creations like angels also exist, as long as they do not uh, uh, over-influence us, as they do not awe us and scare us, as they do not play any real role in our lives, it's okay. You may say they may happen, they may not, but they don't matter much to man because what matters to us is, according to the Holy Quran, belief in Allah, belief in angels, belief in prophets, belief in books, belief in the hereafter. In that list, no ghosts, no jinns are mentioned. <laughs> so the teaching is perfect, it is not deficient. What is important is only that much. Apart from things, there are other things, of course, we know in life. But they should be taken, it, taken as casually and coexisting, maybe but should not uh, overawe you by like some people are overawed by these by these uh, concepts of jinns etc etc and they cannot hurt you if Allah does not permit them to do so I quoted one example from uh, an experience of my example uh, which relates to an experience of Hazrat Mizar Bashir Ahmed Sahib, late Hazrat Mizar Bashir Ahmed Sahib, the son of Hazrat Musim of Islam, and you know the type of man he, he was. If you have not uh, read about him, I tell you, he was a very correct person. 
very scientific in his attitude, very methodical and not in the least uh, superstitious. Once he told me himself of an experience which I had to take literally exactly as he related because he was not a psychic type of person. If anybody knew him, he would know that he was a proof against all superstitions. He once related to me that uh, in one of we call a big larger room in his house, uh, a Kacha Dalan. It was uh, built with mud bricks inside and uh, baked brick from outside. So as the inside was made of mud bricks, it was called Kacha Dalan. Kacha means which is not baked not uh, put to fire, I mean, uh, material made uh, stronger with the help of fire, you know, those bricks are called kachi bricks. So he said, once I uh, re retired for sleeping there, I was alone, there was no one else in the house, the family had gone elsewhere somewhere, and I bolted the room from within and uh, went to my bed and I was about to sleep and was still awake when I suddenly felt a very powerful pressure as if of two hands pressing against my legs and it was so strong that my legs seemed to give in with the pressure and sink deeper into the bed and I no, nothing was seen nobody was there so I addressed to that something which was doing it. I said, if you have come with the permission or order of Allah to do me any harm, then I, I don't care in the sense that I submit to the will of Allah and very happy. Do and, and, and uh, whatever you are told, do. You will find me cooperative in that regard. But if you are not from Allah and you want to scare me, then I tell you, I am not the man to be scared. <laughs> you know, take, go to whatever, I mean, do whatever you may. I will not be scared. I, am, I believe in the unity of Allah and I don't believe in other nonsense. And as he said, he said the pressure was released. Now, I, I added that he couldn't see anything, but I forgot to mention you that it was the darkness in the room which ordinarily occurs. You can, with effort, you may see something, but uh, there was no light in the room. Everything was, light was put off before he went to bed. So when the pressure was released and that something disappeared, then he got up and to make sure if the room was bolted. And because of that uh, dim vision, he could not have seen somebody. He went to the uh, to the door and the door was bolted, locked. There is no other passage from outside to inside. So he said, this is my personal experience that something, some phenomenon does exist which we can't understand fully. But uh, the attitude to that should be exactly the same. You should not be covered by that. You should not be afraid of this. And uh, take that to be something which coexists somehow but will not be permitted by God to interfere with your life.